pequeno. So I was thinking about what I would do today. Um, in my earlier class, I didn't want to do a, like a Q&A or a review thing because that would put you guys at a disadvantage for the test. So I decided to just do something new. And the next logical thing for me to teach you is trig substitution and how to do trig integrals, but I don't think I could do that in one session. I'll need a couple to get through all the nuances and a lot of examples because it's kind of weird. And after that, the next logical thing would be to teach you partial fractions, integration by partial fractions, but that also kind of sketchy to get that done in one session. So after much thought, improper integrals one out. I'm going to talk about the idea of an improper integral. So again, this is something you would see again in Pal 2. And it's when we want to do find definite integrals over some strange intervals. So I'll tell you what these guys are. The definite integral of f is called improper. If one of two things happen, Either the interval doesn't behave, that is, A is negative infinity, and or B is positive infinity, or, I guess you could also say and or. The function itself doesn't behave. F of x is discontinuous. At, we'll say isolated points, for lack of a better phrase at the moment, in the closed interval. So here we want to find a definite integral on some interval where the interval is actually infinite in length or um, the function doesn't behave at some point in the interval. Either at A it's undefined or it's undefined at B or it's undefined at some point in between them, perhaps several points. And technically speaking, it could be undefined at an infinite number of points as long as the infinity isn't too large. Um, so, despite being improper, This guy may yield a finite value. Say I. And in this case, we say the integral converges to I. Otherwise, we say it diverges. Now, in one situation, so you could have a situation where you're finding the area under a curve, but you never actually stop the interval from expanding. And sometimes you could get a finite area. Okay, so that's crazy in and of itself, or it sounds crazy at the moment, but remember, we just uh, computed integrals by adding up an infinite number of things and we got values there. So uh, maybe this isn't so much of a stretch, which it might seem strange at first. Um, in the second case, that one is a little bit more believable. Because if you have an integral, if you have a function, right? let's say you can actually integrate it, but it's undefined at one point. Let's say there's a hole right here. Which means for that x value, the function is not defined, but otherwise we're fine. What you'll realize is, if I wanted to find the area between A and B, knowing that I can't actually plug in a certain x value C, what that means is, 
this line here is excluded from com in, the, in the area computation. But it seems to make sense that I could somehow find the area of everything else with no problem. And then you might ask the question, well, how much area did that line take away? Well, nothing. An area doesn't have any width. A, a line has no width. So technically, the fact that along this line the function doesn't work is irrelevant when computing the area. So I can actually get a meaningful answer here. So the function might not work, but somehow finding an area can make a lot of sense. And sometimes, even though an area would cover an infinite length, um, it sometimes could add up to a finite value. And there are many, many, many applications of having integrals where you're considering them over in infinite length intervals. Um, we're not going to get into that though. I'm just going to. We're going to do one session and really get down to the nitty gritty, the things that you have to know to compute these guys. Um, but there are a lot of cool paradoxes and stories that I could throw in here. But right now, we're just going to get down to the, the important, the highlights of this topic. So now you might wonder, how do you, how do you compute such integrals? And the calculus answer, once again, um, almost not surprisingly, is limits. Use limits to approach the bad points. Not a technical term, I'm just calling it that. Okay, so bad points is, is either um, plus or minus infinity or a point where the function is undefined. Call those bad points. So technically our function will not behave at these points. I call them bad, so like here the C is a bad point. Um, so because we cannot actually be at that point, we kind of do the next best thing. We just approach that point as close as we can, arbitrarily close, and then see how the area behaves to this approach. Now sometimes the uh, limit will work out, and then we say the integral converges. If the limit does not work out, we say the integral will diverge. So the strategy here. So when you have an improper integral, um, one, uh, expose the bad points if they aren't already. Exposed. Two. A um, couple classes ago, I mentioned that we can actually split up an integral um, over some interval. And so, what we can do is, if necessary, split the integral so that one back point appears. We'll have to do these situations one at a time, uh, just to get the theory to work out, for the Riemann sums to work out. Dealing with two undefined points from both ends at the same time is kind of complicated. So we kind of want to isolate the bad points. Three, set up limits to approach the bad points. I'll show you what this looks like in practice. You compute the integral as usual. And five, take the limits. If all limits
converts to a finite value. Then I converges to the sum of these. Otherwise, it diverges. Where I is representing the value of my integer. Uh, let's jump into some examples. super important, you'll realize just how important in Calc 2 and 3 um, and 4, but consider this integral, 1 to infinity of 1 over x to the p, for what p, uh, p is just a real number, does this converge? few examples to get through the swing of things. Um, like I said, you'll delve more into the theory in the next class, but I just want you guys to get used to the computation aspect of it, so we can get through one session. So, let me show you as an example how to do A. Now, something's obviously up with this one. Here, we have infinity on the limit of an integral. Um, so I'm considering an infinite interval. Right? So 1 over x squared, one side looks like that. The other side would look like that, but we only care about the right side. So in other words, this is asking me, what is the area under this curve from 1 to forever? Does that area actually exist? infinite? Is it not infinite? Seems like a silly question to ask probably, but it's actually a very important question to ask. There are a lot of applications to being able to answer this kind of question. So, two things will make something improper. Um, one, the function is undefined on the interval that you're considering. Notice that this function is undefined when x equals 0. However, 0 is not on our interval, so we're cool. Um, the problem, though, is that one limit is infinity. And that's an issue. That's not even a number. So there's only one bad point here, quote unquote, and he's already exposed. And there's only one bad point per integral. So I would move on to step two, and I would use a limit to approach that number. So. I'm going to let n approach infinity of the integral from 1 up to n of 1 over x squared dx. So in other words, I pick a, another point, call it n, some finite distance away, and I'm computing this area, and all I do is push the n further and further and further and further, and so I'm accumulating area as n goes off to infinity, and we want to see, does this ever actually um, stop somewhere? So now we're in the step where you compute this integral just as you would under normal circumstances. So 1 over x squared, you do that by the power rule, write it as x to the minus 2, integrate that, you'll get minus 1 over x between 1 and n. A 
apply the fundamental theorem of calculus, you plug in the n minus, plug in the 1, and so you end up with that limit. Now, of course, in general, I'm, I'm giving you very simple examples here, but in general, the limit could look very nasty. You might have to use L'Hopital's rule or some other crazy theorem. But here, this limit should be roughly simple. What happens to 1 over n as n goes to infinity? Yes. So this part will go to 0. And then here, I just have minus a minus 1. So I actually get positive 1 is the answer. So this area is not infinite. It actually has a value. The value is 1. Kind of strange to think, but yeah, the area, that infinite area is not quite infinite. It's actually 1. We can know this because the area will never be greater than 1. We'll never get to a point where it's bigger than 1. But any value that we pick less than 1, eventually the area is going to pass that value. We have to say it's exactly 1. So this integral, I can say, converges. In fact, I can say it converges to 1. Let's look at a different part of this guy. So looking at the same function, 1 over x squared, let's see what is the area between 0 and function, here's my 1, here is 0, I want to actually compute that here. So, obviously here 0 is a bad point, our function is undefined there, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to approach 0 with the limit. Notice that the shaded region is on the right side of 0, so I need to approach 0 from the right side. So this is going to be equal to the limit as n approaches 0 from the right side of n up to 1, 1 over x squared dx. This, of course, is going to be minus 1 over x between 1 and n. Apply the fundamental theorem of calculus, plug in the top number, I would get minus 1, minus plug in the bottom number, I would get 1 over n. And what happens to 1 over n as n gets approaches 0 from the right side? Yeah? It's a positive infinity. So I have minus 1 plus infinity. That's infinity. So here, this one diverges. Which can tell you a lot of things. Um, one thing is that division by zero is super bad. Like we can deal with infinite area, but once we approach division by zero, um, things can get really ugly really quickly. Yeah, so that actually has no <laughs> finite area. Approaching zero, we actually get an infinite area here. And it, it doesn't give us a meaningful value that we can actually do anything with. It can tell us about the behavior of the function, but uh, other than that, we can actually, it's not a computable value. Now, those two taken together should make this obvious, what's happening here, but let's compute it anyway. Because at this point, we have an excuse to split up the integral, so you'll see what a situation like that would look like. That integral is also improper, and it's improper because of two reasons. One, the infinity, but also because of the zero. There are two bad points here. Whenever we see that, what we want to do is we want to break up the integral so that only one bad point is exposed per integral. So um, I can split this up into 0 to some number plus from that number up to infinity. 
and pretty much any number we pick can work here. We, have, we, all, we saw that you know, integral from A to B can be thought of as from A to C plus C to B. And so let's just pick one here, just because we actually computed each of those. Now what you'd realize is that here you'd set up two separate limits. Let's say we never really, we didn't know what these values were in the beginning. We would have set up two limits, approaching zero from the right, plus set up another limit with a different variable, say m, approaching infinity. And you go through and you compute each of these. Now, what you'd look for is, do they both give me a meaningful answer? And we saw that this one did, this gave us one, and we saw that this one will actually give us infinity. And so we have one of the integrals here misbehaving, and once one of them misbehaves, everyone misbehaves. It doesn't make any sense to be adding infinity to one. So I would say this diverges. what you think the setup of that one would look like. Get the rest of the tenants here. What are the bad points here? is actually continuous everywhere, right? You never divide by zero because one plus x squared is never zero. This graph, uh, it actually looks like a bell. It looks like that going off. And we only care about the right side, so we want to see, does the area there make any sense? Does it give us a finite value? So the limit as n approaches infinity. Do you know what the integral of 1 over 1 plus x squared is? That's arc time, time inverse. So, plug in the n, minus plug in the 0. Do we know what arc time of 0 is? is always defined. Tan inverse is continuous everywhere. Yeah, it's zero. It's zero. Now, as n approaches infinity, what does tan inverse approach? Spiral two. So this actually does have a meaningful answer. It's pi of two. You can remember that. Of course, your tan inverse graph, it has a horizontal asymptote at pi over 2, and one at minus pi over 2, and it looks like a, an S.
Okay, so those are some uh, simple examples. The examples can be a lot sneakier. Of course, I you'd see a lot more of those in the next class. But you could even see something like, uh, let's say you're see something like that. That's actually an improper integral. I know it looks innocent, but it's actually not. Um, why? Yeah? Okay. Anything else? Yeah? Also one, right? So this guy is bad news in, in two places. Notice that you factor this guy It would have problems at 0 and 1. So on this interval from minus 2 to 2, at 0 there is a problem and at 1 there is a problem. In fact, your, your function hits asymptotes here. And so in order to compute this, you see something like this. And it's something you, you're always going to be thinking about. Once you, you, once you take calc 2, you're always worrying about this now. In calc 1, I never gave you a situation like this. So you never have to worry about it. But after Calc 2, in Calc 2 and later, you will always be worrying about this. Does this function actually make sense on the interval? Um, how you would do that is, again, you'd expose all the bad points. So 0 would have to be exposed. Then uh, the 1 would have to be exposed. However, now, notice you have two bad points. You'd actually have to split that up further. So you'd actually split it, say, minus 2 to 0, plus, say, 0 to something else, like a half, plus a half up to 1, plus 1 up to 2. So you can split this integral up. And in the first case, that's one bad point. Second case, one bad point. Third case, one bad point. Fourth case, one bad point. So they can be very sneaky. So it is something that you're going to have to worry about. They might not announce themselves. Right? So you can go ahead and try to do it this with an integral and, and think you don't have anything to worry about, but you know, something might actually hit you down the road if you don't even realize. And there are times when you can compute something and it seems to give you an answer, but it's because you forgot it was an improper integral and it actually shoots off to infinity somewhere in the middle. And so the answer really was infinity, but then you got five. And then, you know, the bridge falls down or whatever. You were doing the integral to figure out. It doesn't work out. Um, now, this guy is a very important integral. And it depends on a real number p. start by saying infinity is going to be the only bad point here because your x is 0 is also bad, but that's not, you don't have to worry about that. So let n approach infinity of 1 to n, 1 over x to the p. Now we immediately run into some issues here because it turns out that to integrate this, 1 over x to the p can actually change, right? It turns out if your p is 1, then this integral is 1 over x and we get an ln, right? But if your p is literally anything else, you would, you would actually do the power rule. So it splits into two cases. You have to worry about when p is 1 versus when p is not. Then you can start to think about situations like, well, what if the power here is negative? Well, that would mean that it would flip to the top, and that's going to create a whole different scenario. So you probably consider both parts here. Um, say p is bigger than 1 versus p is less than 1. These scenarios might end up being different. So ultimately here, we do three cases. What if uh, p is 1? What if p is less than 1? And what if p is greater than 1? Let's do these one at a time. 
in the event p is 1, I just have that my integral is the limit as n approaches infinity 1 up to n of 1 over x. Well, the integral of 1 over x is ln perhaps the value of x. Apply the fundamental theorem of calculus. Log of 1 is 0. And as n approaches infinity, ln approaches infinity. So this diverges. So the people one case doesn't work out. What about less than 1? In this case, our i would be the limit as n approaches infinity of 1 up to n. Of course, for anything other than 1, I'm going to use the power rule, so let me rewrite it like that. And this will give me, well, x to the p plus 1 over, add 1 to the power, divide by the new power, plug in 1 and n. I get the limit as n approaches infinity of n to the minus p plus 1 over 1 minus p minus 1 over 1 minus p. Now you consider the fact that if our p is less than 1, this guy here will be positive. So now, if I'm letting that go to infinity, it's infinity to a positive power. That's going to go up to infinity. So this also diverges. So that doesn't work out. Okay, we have one more chance. Uh, what if p is greater than 1? Then the integral looks like this. Apply the power rule like that. Apply the fundamental theorem of calculus and get this. Now, if your p is larger than 1, this guy is now negative. So now we have infinity to a negative power, which makes this term go to zero, and the result is simply going to be one over, um, I can put p minus one. So this one converges. Which is quite interesting. This integral, um, quite an important integral, uh, it converges only in the case that p is greater than 1. In fact, this is such an important thing, it's actually a theorem. This integral converges if and only if your p is larger than 1. It's actually a very important fact. This is important for many reasons, but here's one of them. We have another theorem. It's 
called comparison theorem. Yes? Oh, I, I flipped the denominator. So it was 1 minus p, I just turned it to p minus 1. Comparison theorem, super useful. And this guy happens to be super useful for many situations over here. It says the following. Suppose um, we have functions g and f. Are integrable, and suppose that we know that our g of x is always less than the f of x. Then this would mean that their integrals are actually maintain the inequality. We saw that that was a property of integrals. Saw that a couple classes ago. However, we are going to extend this to improper integrals in the following way. So I'm considering an interval um, a to infinity. So one function is always less than the other on this interval. Then it means that their integrals will maintain this inequality. That's not what the comparison theorem is about because we knew that two classes ago. Um, then we have, so here's the important statement. One. If the integral of G diverges, so does f and 2. If the integral of f converges, so does g. Now, I think this makes intuitive sense, but it is something that you have to prove very carefully. Um, but basically what the statement is saying, okay, so we know both of these guys are positive, and we're, they, they will give some value or they'll diverge to infinity, right? They can diverge to negative infinity because they're always bigger than zero. The integrals are always going to give you something positive. So they'll either give us a number or they'll both go off to infinity. So here's the thing. If this guy goes off to infinity, then that guy has to go off to infinity as well because he's smaller than that. He always has to be bigger than this. So if he blows up, he has to blow up. So that's what this statement says. Conversely, if this guy doesn't diverge, if he stops at a number, then this one will also have to stop at a number. He can't pass it. Right? So that's called a comparison theory. And it gives us the power to talk about the convergence or divergence of one integral by knowing the convergence or divergence of some other integral. Um, a lot of times it's about the convergence or divergence of this integral. It seems to turn out. Because we, we kind of know how polynomials relate to a lot of other functions. So if we know that a certain polynomial to a certain power, how it behaves, and we can compare that to some other function we care about, we can talk about that integral by looking at this integral. because polynomials are super useful in that. So this is called a comparison theorem, very important theorem. Um, there's an equivalent theorem in series, but you also have one for integrals. Let me give you an example of where, how you can apply this theorem. Let's look at this integral. integral that 
For one reason or another, it's important to me. Whatever research I was doing or whatever problem I was looking at, this guy pops up. Now I want to know, does this give a meaningful answer? So this is meaningful in some context. We'll, we'll pretend. And so if this doesn't give a meaningful answer, I want to know. So I abandon that approach because I'm like, this is going to be impossible to implement. Versus if it actually does give an answer, I want to know it gives an answer. So then I can work on approximating what that answer is. And then I'd be able to use it for whatever I want. So this is what pops up. And now I want to know, do I want to actually waste time looking for the answer? And this row could be way more complicated than this, where it's, it's a matter of, man, now I'm going to have to devote months of heavy, intense computing time. I'm going to have to set a bunch of computers working on figuring this out. If there's no actual answer, that's just wasted time and energy. Right? So now you might want to say, oh, OK, how would I know whether it's worth, the endeavor is worth it? Well, one thing you could note is that the cosine squared, for one, it's always positive, greater than or equal to zero. Um, it's zero when cosine is zero, but otherwise it's larger. And cosine squared is actually bounded above by one. So of course, that would imply that this expression is bounded above by this expression. those are bounded below by zero. It then stands to reason if I integrate these, that relationship is maintained. So now I look at those two guys. Now we already, we already saw that this converge. We know this converges. So we can apply the, the comparison theorem right away. Um, but um, let's pretend we didn't actually compute this. But if we didn't know, instead of computing this integral, what I probably would have done is approximate this guy with another thing. That is definitely less than 1 over x squared. Because if you make the denominator of a fraction smaller, the fraction gets larger. And what does this guy look like? Well, this guy looks like the integral of 1 over x to the p dx, where the p is equal to 2. That is, of course, means p is larger than 1. So that means that this guy converges. So we know that this guy converges to some answer. Might not know what that answer is, but I know it's out there. right? This stops at a number, which means that this one must stop at a number. So this allows me to talk about this integral without actually working with that integral. I can work with a much simpler integral that I fully understand and then make conclusions about this one. And thank heavens, because this guy doesn't have an antiderivative. I couldn't actually compute that by hand even if I wanted to. However, knowing that the answer is out there, now I can start to uh, actually put some computing power behind finding that answer. Right? So just start setting up finite intervals, have some supercomputer compute that and then keep pushing the interval higher and higher until I get enough decimal places that satisfies my needs. And then I'll get an answer for this guy that is good enough for whatever thing I want to use it for, and we're off to the races. As opposed to not knowing whether it converges or diverges, and then not knowing whether I should chase this or not. Okay. So comparison theorem is very useful. and. There are several kinds of comparison theorem. This is one that applies to integrals. But it allows you to talk about integrals without actually talking about them. Just compare them to something else. And a lot of the times, this guy is a very good guy to compare things to. 
So if you can get one of these guys on the right side that converge, you know that this guy must converge. If you can get one of these guys on the left side that diverges, that's when your p is less than 1, less than or equal to 1, then you'll know that this guy also diverges. And so you can kind of figure that out. integrals in a nutshell, I mean, it's pretty much the same thing you would learn in Calc 2, but with a lot less fluff. I'm not talking about any cool applications here. But that's how you kind of deal with them. And the comparison theorem is a very important theorem. Um, so, technically, you're not responsible for this on the final, but um, at a class, kind of, always. If you want to waste it, you might as well learn something new. That will help you out next semester. I will see you guys uh, on Wednesday. Wednesdays are fine. Wait, can we come here? Yeah, I'm pretty sure it's in the same room. And it's at I, right? I, I believe so, but check the syllabus to make sure. And I'll post I'll post a mock file. I won't post the answers though, but I'll